Call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners, uh, April 3rd at 5.15. Commissioner Ernst? Commissioner Engel? Commissioner Rollins? Commissioner Vogelsang? Commissioner Wright? Here. Uh, any changes to the agenda? Nope. Public requests? Do we have any? Good evening, Harold Chaffee, uh, 6200 Northwest 2nd Avenue, President of Keep Golf and Boca. Um, I was reading the agenda. I think we're going to talk tonight or just try to get some kind of a a proposal for the um, the southeast side of um, of Ocean Breeze property. Um, I, I I just hope that we we go a little more in deep into it. There's a lot of things that probably that you're going to talk about tonight about securing that we do make some money. It's not a failure, and somebody can you know we had somebody who wants to do it has the money to base it to do it to invest a lot of money into that property. Um. The other thing too is I looked at I didn't see an exhibit A or B in the um in the in the um in the RFI. I don't know whether it was missing or you didn't put it in there. Anyway. You're talking about the RFP for the, yeah, the RFP, facility? Yeah, no exhibit yeah, it's the exhibit, it's the it's the it's our um conceptual master plan. And it's our enabling legislation. Those are the two exhibits that we would put in there. I didn't put it in the agenda packet because when we make the file too big, we can't get into everybody's emails. So we get a lot of returns. So we just limit some of those things. I didn't put all the forms in there either, but the forms are listed on one page. So there's a lot of forms that they'll have to sign to, like 15 different ones. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Those forms. Hi, everybody. Angelo Sands, 7348 East Country Club Boulevard, Boca Raton, Florida, 33487. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we have just seen a community come together like never before uh, with the FAU basketball team. Uh, it was just tremendous to be a part of it. Uh, even if you were sitting at home watching it on TV, you were part of it. But those, those young men started the love of that game when they were very, very young on probably a playground similar to what you guys have been doing for as long as you've been sitting there. And obviously longer than that. Because the love of the game, the love of the game begins usually very early in life. I've been coming to these meetings since 2016, since our course closed, because I wanted to continue the love of the game for the kids that would want to use a facility that they could actually get on. And, and really, not, not for a, a place I could play, because I realized that whatever we build there, wouldn't be a full-fledged golf course. I understand that. But the work that we have done as far as golf is concerned is so that we can hopefully, hopefully at some time, look at TV and realize that that young man, that young girl, got their start at a local, a local golf course where they could play. Like I said, we, we as a community, owe so much to the FAU basketball team for, for a period of time, put everything above our worries, our concerns, our fears. You know, once there was a Supreme Court judge and then the, when the, it was called the Museum in Washington, D.C., that museum has gone under. But over the door of going into that room, the Supreme Court judge has a saying, had a, which is there. It said, I always look at the comic, at the sports page first, because when I do that, I see the best in man. 
I always look at the front page last because that is always where I see the worst in man. So what we're doing is trying to create the best in man as far as our little niche, as far as our little place, which is that little golf course so that we can get the kids to love the game as much as we love the game. Oh, I love the game. <laughs> okay. So thank you. It's nice to be back. I'm healthy. I can walk again. So thank you. Take care. Hello, all. Um, my name is Anthony Sol Solberti, and I live in uh, 6200 Northwest 2nd Avenue in Boca Raton, Florida. I uh, just wanted to do a, a very I guess this is the Boca Tica Racket Sports Facility RFP is a very, very preliminary uh, start of what is going to be there. And um, I've been a tournament racquetball player for maybe 20 years. Uh, I have a, a small patent in that, in that uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, items that you would use in racquetball. So I know a lot about it and where that sport is going as well as where pickleball is going. And I'm a little familiar with how many tennis courts there are. When you talk about a, a racket sports facility, I hope you all just keep in mind, because I heard uh, Miller Leg talk about a multi-use court. Um, last two, two and a half years, I've been an, an avid pickleball player, not playing racquetball. It's so hard on my body. But I'd like to, I'd like you to put in your brain uh, just the seed of when people talk about a multi-use court for anyone that's really avid of the sport, like when you have a tennis court with pickleball lines, it, it eliminates certain shots, period. You can't do certain shots because the net's higher and the posts are a lot wider. It, I'm just hoping that when you get these proposals, you encourage the people that give the proposals to have a designated sport for each designated area. And then that only then can you have the really avid players, whatever the sport may be, uh, really get into that at that facility. Uh, that being said, I, I would like to point out that I know pickleball. You know what? It's loud. It, it does a clunk, clunk, clunk. Um, so it's a concern of where it's put. If it is put at all, I'm hoping it's put there. And I'm hoping, you know, my own personal there's a lot of tennis facilities with a little bit of pickleball, and I'm hoping for just the opposite, a pickleball facility with maybe a little bit of tennis. There's tennis courts that are empty everywhere, and there's also a lot of tennis courts that are being used. I'm not sure if we need any, but, you know, that's my personal views, but I want you to keep in mind, or I know Raul pretty well. Um, he knows a lot of, uh, he has a lot of knowledge. I hope you guys reach out to him if he's not on air and he's going to speak, but my, my major concern and my me, re reason for me to get up here uh, is because I got a new hat. I want to show it off. And it's uh, it's not helping me. I have another pickleball hat. It looks make me look even older. I want you to know the multiple use courts in any sport. It takes a little bit of everything from every from each sport that it tries to conquer. You might be able to play the game, but you're not going to get the avid player. So please keep that in mind when you get these RFPs. Maybe you can encourage them not to go that route. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, we do. Anybody online like to speak? Please raise your hand. Nobody? Okay. That portion of the meeting. And we'll do approval of the minutes of the previous board meeting held on March 20th at 5.15. Approved. Okay, Joanne. Commissioner Ernst. Commissioner Engel. Yes. Commissioner Rollins. Yes. Commissioner Vogelson. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Motion passes. Okay, we'll move on to regular business. Um, first item is the Ocean Strand Lift Station easement. Go again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, on page six in your agenda packets was the agreement. We did place revised agreements in everybody's folder. There's two corrections to the agreement that was published in the packet. 
One is on item number seven. It said grantor and it should have said grantee. And then there was a typo on our chair's name in the last page for, um, thank you. So just a typo on Aaron's name and the last page, but otherwise number seven, instead of grantor, it would say grantee is responsible for removing the invasives. And otherwise, if there's any other changes, we'll, we'll go back and have Sam work with their attorney on those changes. Madam Chair, if I can quickly just to add for the record, this document has not been shared with uh, anyone except you all. I mean, it's a public document, obviously, so it's, it's open to, to public review. But given the directions of the meeting that I attended with regard to Mr. Rabin's presentation, this document reflects, generally speaking, in, in some specific instances, your direction, not his. So this document has not been vetted yet by the folks that asked for it, uh, except you're the ones that will be granting it, so you get the ones to make that decision. So whatever additional changes or comments or notes you would like to suggest to us this evening, we can then change in the document and submit it to counsel for the, uh, uh, the grantee uh, on the basis that it was vetted publicly and that it's subject to further comments you may have as well. So that would be worth noting. Yeah. Chair, um, did I overlook anything in here that um, allocated the uh, maintenance of that uh, easement to the city, or is that something that we will be responsible for maintaining? Uh, this, this language in paragraph six, my mic is not really working. I can't, I can't hear myself. But the grantee shall ensure that all the grantor is properly disturbed and used, but it uh, continues on. Um, maintenance or repair um, is essentially part of that obligation. And the intention is that whoever gets the easement has the maintenance obligation. This, this is not to be maintained by the district. Ultimately. Is that clear enough in the statement here that we are not responsible for the maintenance? We can, we can again, we can modify to the extent possible to make it even more clear that the district is not doing so and will not be doing any maintenance. Mr. Rollins, they're having a hard time online hearing you. If you'll just lean in a little bit more. Lean in and a little bit more. Also, uh, Sam, same. I, I think Sam has the context. What I was trying to do is just uh, making that clear that uh, future maintenance of this easement was not our responsibility. Right. So and that modification, I guess, will be made. So it's much clearer. And we can clarify that language as well. I have a couple questions. Uh, does this agreement bind the residents who live nearby to tie into the infrastructure? And if so, at whose expense? And then if they object, are we subject to pay their expenses? Mayor Spahn, Madam Chair, this document does not reflect on that concept. And it's an important concept. <clears throat> During the course of the presentation by council for the grantee, there was conversation about the future connection to others in the neighborhood who are currently on septic. As you know, state law recommends and requires in certain jurisdictions that you convert septic to, to sewer at some future moment. As you probably know from the, based on this, this documentation and the presentation alone, um, that the cost of connection is not inexpensive. Septic to sewer is costly and there's a connection charge for doing so. This document does not, does not independently mandate that future potentially affected parties connect to sewer to the extent that that would be an issue for the board to make, you certainly could make it. Uh, remembering at the end of the day, the objective here is that this easement would be assigned to the city, to the city of Boca Raton, and they would be the ones that would have to impose the obligation. If you impose it now, it's a future obligation that would vest in the city to maintain against the unit, unit owners there. So if you would choose to make that an obligation, we could. Again, this document and this concept and this relationship was not to be at any cost or expense to, to the district. You're making an accommodation. And that accommodation should um, reimburse you for any cost and expense to make the accommodation. But in the future, there should be no maintenance obligation of any kind or any other requirement imposed on the district. So if you would choose to add that, we can. At least look to the city to see what their intention is. We can. We can leave that as a bracketed item open for discussion. I mean, at some point in every in every local government's comprehensive plan, there's an obligation over a certain number of years to convert from septic to sewer, um, unless you're in a certain rural part of the state of Florida, which has a different time frame. But in the less rural areas, and we're not in a rural area here, 
the objective is to convert. And that, that may be in the city's comprehensive plan and it may be sooner rather than later. And this document would be a vehicle to do that. You... Questions for Sam. Um, can you kind of guide me where, and maybe I just overlooked it, how this will be assigned to the city? Because I was kind of looking for that part of it. The objective is it is to be assignable, and if the language regarding assignability is not clear, we can clarify the fact that at the end of the day, it's the objective of the district to have the, the city become the ultimate grant, uh, owner of the easement. We can we can do that, Commissioner. Okay, thank you. I th no, that, you're right. I'm, I'm looking to see. There's, there's, there's no... Might be any, I just didn't see it, and so I was kind of thinking that our goal would be to take this document and give it to the city and let the city yes. and do whatever they... Be sure that we're in coordination with the city and they do how they want it to work. Without condition. I mean, the objective so, is that once we grant it, we would the eventual eventuality it's going to be assigned to the city. Right. Correct. Understood. So thank There's you. No liability for the district. Uh, since uh, this whole, whole thing has started, I would imagine that, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the city mandates of wherever there is a lift station or access to uh, a sewer infrastructure that uh, adjoining properties must connect. Is that is that a a, a regulation that the uh, city has? Again, the mayor, Madam Chair. The issue of septic to sewer is the concept in every city's comprehensive plan, which is required of every city in the state of Florida. Every county in the state of Florida has to have a comprehensive plan. The objective is to, is to veer away from um, septic, the end result of which is that there's a timing point when local governments have to impose it on their residents. Uh, the issue of who pays for it. In some instances, it's paid for over time. Some certain cases, it's paid for when you sell the property. A number of things can occur. But if it be the wish which I believe it is from, from listening to, to Commissioner Vogel saying about the issue, as to open up that door in this document to suggest that it, it, it would be your intention to either, if it's an, un, it's an imposition of the city to impose it, that the cost and expense of doing so is not the district's to, to incur. And secondarily, it's theirs to enforce. This, this both if there, and a cost issue. Yeah, so if there is indeed uh, a mandate by the city that, uh, that adjoining properties need to connect to the city sewer system because now there's a lift station available. This really, ha uh, that's out of our domain. We're just another per another entity connecting to the to the lift station. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Thanks. That's the intention. Um, of course, the other reservation, which is in the document, which is in paragraph uh, four, does provide for the future development of our property, of district property, which would then allow us at some future moment to connect for the purposes of our own development whatever limited development that may be. So we can add that we can add that language as well. And by the way, my objective with your concurrence with these changes is to revise the document, um, send it to the council for the for the uh, for the applicant, uh, Mr. Mr. Abrams, with the condition that it's subject to further comments of the board because because he may have further comments as well and the document's not final until you finally approve it. Make the change, yes, yes, ma'am. Please do. Commissioner Ernst, Commissioner Engel, yes, Commissioner Rollins, yes, Commissioner Vogel saying, Commissioner Wright, yes, motion passes. And I'm sure if I read the motion correctly, we'll make those changes consistent with your discussion this evening. We'll share those changes with the applicant's council, but it's subject to your further review. That's the objective. This is a document that's in, it's, a, it's a work in progress. There's another party here that's not yet seen the document either. It's the city. City before um, anyone signs it? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Because if, if, with all due respect, if this document meets your expectations and the applicants, but not the city's, we have a bit of a challenge at that point. Understood completely. We're, we're not trying to act, act adversely to them. We, we don't, but we'd like to be more, more harmonious to make sure that we are not adverse. 
Our city is very meticulous, so we appreciate you working closely with our city colleagues. I, I respect meticulousness, yes, and specificity. Thank you. All right, moving on to um, number two, the Boca Tica Racket Sports Facility RFP. Mr. Page 12, the packets is the um, RFP for the Racket Sports Facility, which is part of the um, conceptual master plan that the board approved for Boca Tica. So that's on the southeast corner, contemplated there. Um, happy to make any changes to it or talk about it just for a matter of, of the public. In the agenda packets on page 31, it lists a number of forms that would be part of this. We didn't put those in the agenda packets because it increases the size of the document, but we're happy to send them out if anybody wants us. They're standard forms that we put in most of our RFPs, so happy to send those out. Um, but anyway, any... Uh, Comments. I'm happy to hear them, incorporate them, change them. I just wanted to say, do this, do this. Um, in response to um, Mr. Silberity's comments about, I totally understand that because I've been playing pickleball and I play on courts that have tennis lines and regular pickleball courts. And, um, you know, if you're a pickleball player, you don't really want to play on a tennis court with pickleball with tennis lines and the net is different and all kinds of stuff. I don't really... I don't really think we should put it in the RFP to kind of lock them in. I think we should keep it as is and see what they come back with. Um, I mean, if they're, you know, serious, <laughs> like um, racket sports people, they'll understand that and they'll come back with a, a plan that works, I think, for everybody. Um, so I think, you know, to keep it as general as possible to see what they come back with and for that, you know, the amount of land that we have and, in the neighborhood and see where they put pickleball in relation to the condos because I do I do know it's loud and you can hear 95 from where I live and it's not that far away especially if the wind blows just the right you know way um so I'm excited to put this out there and see what comes back for this piece of property for the racket facility so um does anybody else have any comments Bob I remember in the uh, master plan that uh, Miller Lake presented to us, there was a, um, a, a facility there just south of where the Clintmore Road may or may not go through ultimately. How much space have, or have we allocated toward this facility? And when we're talking about racket sports, uh, how much how many racket facilities are we going to have? Uh, I, I know there's nothing in this on this side of town specifically, but we're putting up 18 uh, racquetball covered courts at Patch Reef. Do we need more over? I, I, I'm just wondering when we're talking about racket for sports, are we talking about uh, indoor uh, tennis? Are mm -hmm. we talking about uh, racquetball? I mean, are we just leaving that open for the person to uh, – uh, in, in their proposal, whoever they might be, and how big of an area are we allocating toward this? I, as I set it aside on the conceptual master plan, it's about six acres. So that's what we listed in this document as a six acre site that they would have. I left it open as far as what, how many courts or what, what's indoors, what's outdoors. But I think I did say in a broad statement, indoor and outdoor uh, racket sports facilities, but left it more open ended. So they, there could be Padel, there could be, um, I think that was on the original conceptual master plan was Padel. And there's a big uh, center in um, Boynton Beach that has indoor courts as well that's kind of set up like this. But um, I left that open-ended to see what we got as far as what people submitted. Yeah, well, you know, if you're talking about indoor, I mean, indoor tennis is uh, – I've played indoor tennis, and it can be fairly noisy. But when you're hitting a, a little solid ball, it's going to be even more so. Uh, and, and, and I understand – having duplicate lines on courts. I mean, that, that's part of the confusion we have over sugar sand where we have all of these lines. And right. I know on even on the rectangular fields where you have a soccer and a football field, you have confusion. So uh, singular sports are, are a lot better. The, the other question, um, and that's just a comment. The, the other question is at w w how much extra area do we have after this facility is uh, put into place? Uh, because if I remember correctly, down at the south end of this, uh, uh, on the eastern uh, portion, uh, there was uh, some some designs for some other recreational. 
and, and I, I would certainly like to see that we have some areas of open play where you know, where if you go to uh, uh, to Hornley, sometimes you'll see signs out there said, you know, you can't play out there because it's under maintenance and, and people are actually removed from there if they're playing there. So I'm hopeful that we'll have some areas that are just open play, unstructured, uh, where community kids can go and either, you know, hit around a, a soccer ball or play a Frisbee or something like that uh, and, and not plan total development of, of this uh, southern portion of that park so we keep it open and make it more more recreational in the standpoint that it's uh, you know unsupervised un unplanned so that we can have those activities that uh, kids just like to do as kids i believe the southern portion was just um additional trails and then an open green space which we kind of just left as is not specific to like there's no field per se, but it's just open area. Um, I, re I recall that, uh, but you know, in one of the plans up uh, originally, there was a, a small, uh, I, I thought there was a small baseball diamond there and some other activities. So I, I wanna encourage us to keep as much open space there as we can to add to the uh, uh, atmosphere of this uh, park that we're building there, so. In the, in the long run, who's going to operate this facility? Propo part of their proposals would be to say who would be, part of it is a uh, developing, constructing, and operating. So part of the proposal, we would see who they intend on having operate the facilities. And this would be guaranteed by a bond? I, I, I left it open as far as how they financed it, but just talked about the statutes and things that they would need to work with. And so I'm not sure how, if, it, it would depend on the proposals. It's kind of open. Um, we sat here through the um, the public not wanting to have a tennis professional run an academy at Patch Reef Park. Uh, I'd like to ensure that uh, this will not happen again at this facility. Uh, only because this is you know this is public land and having a, a tennis professional come out or whatever. I mean, I, I see, I can see pros teaching and what have you, but a specific, uh, say, John McEnroe Tennis Academy, I don't think that the public is going to be real happy, just like they weren't happy with Rafael Nadal. So I'd, I'd like to be very specific about that. Madam Chair, I respectfully disagree with that. And, and I would point back to what you saw with the city council and we'll talk about later, predisposing any kind of decision before it's been presented to you is just not a good idea. And so I personally think that we should be broad in nature and look for proposals from the community and from anyone else. And then we can decide what we certainly do. You sat here though, Craig, when you were on the board when that happened and they were not happy. I just, you know, I'm just afraid that if it comes in, uh, I'm I'm not saying that I'm predisposed. I'm saying that the public is predisposed. People who are very specific and very vocal, and I understand that. And ironically, they've converted to pickleball. So I I I, I believe we have to approach recreation with the, the concept that recreation changes over time, and some things are just going to change. And tennis is one of them as it transitions heavily to pickleball and brings in more users, um, that's great for recreation. It's a down for those homes that are near pickleball because it's loud, you know? And I think there's a bigger concern just kind of addressing the sound effects of it, but we, and, and that's a valid concern from the community. And we have to look at what are the options that we can do to, to minimize all those things. But being kind of broad and open about it, I think is really important. Steve first, and then Bob. If, if I remember uh, the Nadal situation accurately, uh, the uh, rendering for the facility uh, for Patch Reef was kind of overwhelming, and it overtook not only tennis courts, but other parts of the facility. And I think that might have been more the objection back then 
uh, than the fact that there might have been a Rafael Nadal uh, handling it and possibly to uh, the way the finances were going to be handled. Um, but what we're looking for here, I think, is a, a public private, uh, you know, a, a P3. And uh, whoever we we get is going to want to see a return of some kind within the bounds of the law as, as it was outlined to us. Um, so I think we have to keep that in mind. So there may be a John McEnroe or somebody like that who will come in and assuming that he doesn't want to take over the whole thing and pocket all the money and us not getting a return, I think we'll be in better shape this time than we were last time. Because I remember last time seeing uh, the drawing. Yeah, it was kind of that it looked more like a Kmart than a tennis facility. Um, but anyway, uh, I think I agree with Craig. We, we just have to see uh, where things fall out and, um, you know, and, and sort it out from there. I'm, you know, the... Uh... The drawings that we had were massive, covered to almost three walls there of our conference room, and uh, and then I believe that Nadal wanted us to build it and uh, and pay for it, so it it really was not a concept that we could get get our arms around, and and this property doesn't lend itself to something of that uh, scope and magnitude. So, uh, but I I think we just have to see, as Craig said, see what what comes out and if we don't like it we don't have to accept it you know uniformly so but i think that let's let creativity and imagination you know go to work here and 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 see what we get back so. I kind of go back to where we started with this thing um we did the um master plan and so we're start, we're talking about the entire um southeast parcel or are we just talking about nine acres of the southeast parcel six i'm sorry six why are we not talking about all of it rest of the plan as i understood it was part of the trails like it connected to the trails that start on the hills and the other features were the play we could certainly ask in in the rfp if they want to contribute to the rest of the park but i thought that the rest of it was part of the um park our portion oh is That's part of what we have designed in design right now with Little Lake, yes. The material that is available right now is the six acres specifically for racquetball park, rack, some kind of racket sports, mm -hmm. as well as the potential field house that was designed in the parking lot. On that site, on that six acre site, if they were putting in a field house or whatever they wanted to put in with their property, yes, that would be part of it. But as it stands, like in the conceptual master plan, I think they just put a placeholder, a pickleball, Fidel and tennis, indoor tennis. Um, no field house. No, no, but they, not necessarily a field house, but an indoor gym to go with the indoor tennis, like as a, a complimentary portion to that facility if they if they wanted to. And I left it very open for whatever facility, like if, if they wanted to, if they want to have a spot for um, futsal or something inside their indoor area gym right. like that, they could. I certainly don't want to limit it to just. Yeah, I'm with specifics, you 100%. But, what I guess I'm trying to get to is, we want the whole southeast area to be built out. And as part of that whole southeast area, I don't think we want to be too defining on it. I mean, if someone does come back and say, I want to build out this stuff and I want to, you know, build a daycare with it, would we say no? Going in it. So, so um, <laughs> we're, we're just, we're using the portion that we knew we wanted to build out in terms of the buildings, right? So, I mean, do you want, are you talking about building out the entire Southeast portion of the property in terms of like putting buildings across that whole portion? No, um, I'm saying- I think um, we have to give them a allotment of land or else, because if we don't, they could propose an entire stream of buildings along that so Southeast fair enough. portion. So, uh, I, I'm with no? you. I'm so just so looking to get the whole thing built out and done you know, a plan for the whole Southeast side. And so that to me means a lot of different things. There was a hotel on the corner. If, if a developer came in and said, hey, I want to build a new hotel there. I would say, great, well, <laughs> why? If, if well, 
Agreed. If somebody gives us a proposal and they take up 10 acres with their plan and you guys love that, there's no reason why we can't make adjustments to the rest of the design. But as it stands in that conceptual master plan, it was a six acre area. And that's why I just put that in um, into this. But if somebody submits a proposal to you and you love it and it's 15 acres or 20 acres, that's something that you guys could discuss. I don't think it stops that from happening. Okay. It just, it just is presented in here as a six acre site. Uh, the reason I mention this is that Delray is going through their own process of, you know, what to do with the golf course. And they've come to the conclusion that they need to, you know, take part of that golf course and sell part of it to rebuild the rest of the golf course. All I'm looking for is um, a true P3 partner, whoever that may be, willing to invest, whether, I mean, field courts are pretty easy. Building structures is a little more challenging. Um, and I think we also have to have somewhere in there, similar to what we did with the utility easement, the ability to assign it all to the city should the city want to be. They are our partners in this. And assign being whatever agreement we may like is spectacular, have that ability to give it to the city if we should need to, that we collectively, the elected body here and the elected body at the city, all agree this is a value to the overall community, whatever the result of that is. So that's my suggestion, but, and I would give it a long lead time to flush out the ideas because it's gonna take time for people to come to the, the table with ideas. Time for advertising this? I think you really want to- and I'm comfortable with that. Professional proposals, because we got a lot on our plate. Yes. And I just see us taking on, we're, we've got many, many things going on. And this is a very important um, use. I think we have a great plan with the Miller Lake master proposal, but we want to, if we want to really build it out, including the trails, we need to do the whole thing and look at the best we can, because now's your opportunity to do it. Um, and let's continue on that march. But I think it's with the city partner being very involved in it, as well as a defining, you know, what are the different options, Mr. Rock? I just want to ask uh, clarity uh, on something that Craig mentioned. I mean, the east side of the parcel is property that we own exclusively. Uh, we have no partners in that property at the moment, and I don't envision that happening, but I'm just wanting to understand what, uh, what kind of partnership Craig is thinking we might be able to develop there. No, Bob. <laughs> But, I, but I'm looking for maximum flexibility. What I know the district can do and can't do is, yes, we can do this licensing kind of arrangement, but we cannot convey land, we cannot sell land, we cannot rent land. So, But what we can do is we can give land to the city and the city can deal with it. And it is a massive parcel. I get it. We may not want to do that, but just have maximum flexibility so that we can you know, accomplish what the city, the greater community needs. That's all. It's really gotten us a long way on the west side, hasn't it? That, that, that anticipated partnership. So I hate to be cynical about this, but uh, I, I am after a long time in dealing with our partners in this regard. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, the district will have a long time presence over on that property that uh, we've sweated uh, blood, sweat and tears to get that developed. And I, I think we can do that on our own as we have with uh, some of our other other. Uh, properties, uh, you know, and I, I'm I'm only good for a few more years, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can hang on to this property and do it because I think we have a we've had a really good plan. We've really fleshed this out very well. Uh, the 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 walking trails, the bike trails, uh, the open property, um, and to me, I I would consider it uh, fully developed if we allocated whatever the acreage, whether it's six or ten, whatever. If somebody needs a little bit more to make it a profitable, because 
for somebody to do a concession agreement there, they're going to need to be able to make some money off of the project if they're going to put in uh, and supervise it. So, uh, so it may have to be larger, as, as Craig has mentioned. But to me, the property would be fully developed if we had open space at the very tail end of the park and, and tables and picnic areas and just open play areas. I'd, I'd be happy with green space, which we we can't have enough of that uh, in our community because we're uh, we're putting down concrete uh, we're in a lot of different places. So, but you know, it, it may be in the future uh, that uh, we look to the city uh, for some partnership on this. But I think we've got a pretty good grip on our own and without having to do that. And I think uh, I haven't heard any uh, pushback from the city on on this design. In fact, they were uh, I think gave us a green light on on doing this exactly as. Uh, uh, Chairman Wright had um, uh, presented it to the city. So uh, with, all, with all due respect to, to Craig, I'm hoping we can maintain this uh, property on our own and don't have to deed this over to someone else. But. I have a, Craig brought up a point and I have a question uh, for Sam. Um, can we convey property to the city? The answer is that the attorney general has spoken to the issue of leasing, <clears throat> which is precluded by the special act <clears throat> and sale. The, the assumption is being made that in the special act it related to sale to private parties. It did not necessarily contemplate city, a city destination as being illegal or unlawful. I can't answer the question tonight, but I will tell you that the statute does not contemplate that. Okay. It doesn't preclude that. It doesn't preclude it, That's but it, there's a possibility it might. Is that what you're saying? I want to make sure that we don't uh, go ahead and try and do something and find out after the fact via litigation that we're not entitled to do I it. I would go back and look at the actual uh, language in our request letter that we submitted to the AG several years ago um, and whether we actually included local government as a potential option. I don't recall without looking at it. Um, I do know that, that unequivocally, and you've seen the opinion with regard to the to the leasing opportunity. Right. That is another issue. And that does not, by the way, and you've listened to and you've heard, heard, the, heard the presentation of our bond lawyers and Brian Miller to talk about their various sub options and 3P being an absolutely unequivocally valid option for the board in its, in its pursuit of development. But as to in, in, in potential intra-governmental transfer, I would have to look at that. I don't recall that we specifically made, made, made reference to it in the request to the AG. Okay, thanks. Madam Chair, I totally concur with you that if they're hungry enough, maybe they would want to do some walking trails or biking trails in conjunction with um, the uh, other project that they want to do. Do we know if this six acres included the parking or would that be um, additional green space that would be taken up by concrete? It seems to me that uh, you know space is is an issue, and 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 I'm just wondering if it might be uh, appropriate for us to indicate indicate some flexibility in in the size of this property to accommodate uh, the needs of a, a prospective bidder without being so limiting that we would discourage somebody who otherwise might give us uh, a quote by asking for a little a little bigger parcel because all it amounts to is how much revenue per uh, square foot are they going to be able to generate so that they may need more in order to, to generate if it's on their concession agreement uh, to make this a doable project for them to put in infrastructure and uh, and have cover the expense of operation add, add that language just to say that we're not solid on that six acres that it's flexible i'll add language to it Couple things. One is um, I concur with Mr. Rollins. I'm always optimistic on a better relationship with the city. I, I do understand the long history. And um, in some cases, I will call it lack of communication, lack of transparency that got us down the path of spending a lot of money on a golf course that was not um, allowed or facilitated when needed. And then, you know, far as um, the assignment, I and I, I have the letter, Steve, but that's not the letter I was looking for. I was looking for the bylaws of the um, 
the park district. And I think it allows us to con convey un, you know, unlimited, you know, any asset to the city. And so that was what I was kind of going off of. But in it, it's in the enabling le legislation. So you always have the option to give something to the city and the city can deal with the next step. Now, how you do that is a different thing. If the city says, in exchange, I want to give you something else, they can do that. So um, I, th I think you, it wouldn't be, um, you know, we're just giving things away. Although I do agree with um, you, Bob, very much so. We're, we get things done here because we set forth the path on the information that we know. If we don't know something else is going on, we don't know. And therefore, we're not coordinating well when we do that. And that's the frustration of the district. Um, but we, we do have resources, we do have land, and we our goal is the same as the city and the same as the community to provide a community benefit. And I think we'll get there. So it'll, it'll be there. I just look for this proposal to flush out ideas that are beyond putting in cement for racquetball courts, but to do a lot more to contribute to that whole whole area would be more valuable. <clears throat> I just want to make sure it's flexible enough to get all those ideas. That's all. Other discussion? Need a motion? You do, Mr. Yes. Uh, our executive, sec executive director has a point she so wants to just make. Just some clarification before you make your motion. We're going to incorporate the changes um, to make sure that people understand it's flexible as far as the space. And as far as the programming goes, um, as far as the time frame, I know you said you're not in a let it let it go out there, let it um, let it be out there in the public for a while. I just if I say three months and everybody says in a month, where is that? Where are our proposals? Is everybody okay with a 90 day time frame? Or I, I think it. I don't know. I prefer 60 days. Okay. Let it stay out there for a lot longer. You you're not going to get the the creativeness of a proposal in 60 days. You're going to get a few people who can, you'll limit yourself by doing it. So I would say nine months. Nine months? <laughs> I mean, if somebody is taking nine months to come up for, with a proposal for this, I don't think I would want them working for us in the first place to, for nine months. I mean, that's, that's a... To the group, but you're talking about. I'd say then, if then if you want that long, I'll, it, I'll go for ninety it, days. It's, it's a capital project for anyone who has to define how they're going to do it and really get their ducks in a row to make it happen. And so, if you're talking about spending like the Miller Leg people suggested, I think it was seven million dollars for that area, or ten million, someone has to come forward with it, and I don't think it's realistic to put them on the hook for sixty days to have it said and done. This is a, a to me, it's a very bureaucratic paper process because most of it is not talking about anything. Well, it's they're not coming up, they're not doing construction documents for this project. They're coming up with a, a proposal. Um, it's gonna... it's not construction documents and going through the permitting process and all that stuff. It's a proposal on what we can do for you. Um, and I, I think, you know, the people who have been following this property um, also know that we're gonna be doing this as well and probably have been preparing some information for us. <laughs> I think nine months is way too long. Just counter with, think of all the things that are going on currently and the timing of when you're going to get things back um, and the timing that someone would have to do prepare it. But it's up to the group. Yeah, maybe as a interim, we could always do 90 days. Uh, I, I think 60 might be a little bit too short. 90 days. As Craig says, mobilization. That there's been people that I know that have been looking at this for some time, but I think uh, for somebody to uh, do an evaluation, look at the financing, maybe 90 days might be an appropriate time to do this. And uh, and I would hope that within that time frame, we could get some pretty pretty solid uh, ideas. And it, you know, it, I, I guess it's a matter of their imagination as to how they want to see this <clears throat> property developed, and then trying to put together the the uh, a, a spending plan and a capital plan that they would need uh, with financing. And and I'm sure there's people out there that uh, I know I've talked to some and everybody else has too, that uh, looked like they had financing that was pretty, pretty quickly. 
you know, we may find that we get in 60 days, we get uh, the proposals and um, Sam, are we able to close the, uh, the the bid if we say give out 90 days and after yes. 60, we've got everything we need. Can we then so shut it off? The language in the upfront sections gives you that option. Yes. Okay. You reserve that right. Yeah. If, if you do in the language. Yeah. Could we, what, could we do 60 to, and extend it? Because I would feel more comfortable. At, no, I, will, I don't want to advertise it for 90 days in the first ad that goes out. And then that's, that's another legal amendment, then, Madam Chair, to, to limit it to, let's say, 45 days, 60 days with an option to, to extend. That's also possible. If you have everything in place, by the time, if there's 60 of the day, then you wouldn't need to. Do uh, I, I would be amenable to uh, <clears throat> either 60 or 90 days, but with the option to extend uh, the process out uh, in 60-day uh, increments. So if we had 90 days and we didn't see what we wanted to see, we'd add 60 days on to it and so on down the road. Uh, my feeling is that kind of like a, a real estate listing, the first few weeks or the first months will tell us something about what we're going to get. Um, and also like a real estate listing when it's been out there for a while, it gets stale and it's not top of mind. So I would rather have, uh, the ability to keep renewing if necessary, keep extending if necessary, uh, the time frame, so that if we don't get what we're looking for in that first period, then uh, we can always extend it out. And, uh, you know, rather than do it several months and wait till the baby is born, um, you know, just do it in little pieces. You'd say 90 days and we'll do 30 day extensions as needed if we feel like there's not enough uh, proposals turned in after the 90 day ad. Okay. Would the motion, would the motion include? <laughs> Madam Chair, it'd be helpful if the motion includes the language of the time limitation to make sure that you're consistent with what you made the motion yet. But uh, did we agree on the 90 days with it? Then I'd make a motion that we release the RFP uh, for 90 days with an option to extend. Was it 90 days or did we want to do 60 days with an option to extend? Of My motion is for 90 days. 90 days, okay. With an option to extend. Okay. Okay, Joanne? You second it? Steve yeah. seconded it? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Ernst? Yes, but I got a question. Did that also include the flexibility on the, the size of the space? I, okay. I, I will absolutely do all that. Okay. And, I'll, and everybody will get a copy of it before. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Engel? Yes. Commissioner Rollins? Commissioner Vogelson. Commissioner Wright? Yeah. Motion passed. Okay, moving on to number three, Northern Trust Investment Agreement. Commissioners, I'll start this and then I'm going to turn it over to our um, treasurer for more input on this. After our meeting last week, there was some concern over the world of banking, which is um, tumultuous, I guess, to say it best, and how we had our most of our funds invested in SBA. So we made some changes. Um, I'm going to have Commissioner Ernst talk about those changes that were made and why. And then afterwards, or I guess I can ask now for the motion and then you guys can have the discussion. But I need a motion to ratify and authorize an agreement with Northern Trust Investments. I'm going to try to say this right, nunk pro tunk, which Perfect. means now for then. Exactly. Um, so if I can get that motion and then seconded it, and then we can have the discussion and Commissioner Ernst can kind of go through everything. Correct. Yes. So I will make that motion that we described. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. I'm going to try to keep it simple and not bore everyone. Okay, but stop me if I am. So as you know, there is a banking event that occurred a few weeks ago. And um, at our last meeting, I reported on our Monday night meeting that the exceptional earnings on our account. You know, it was, and it, it would enable us to do a little bit more this year than we initially thought. As I recall, it was a little over 500,000 that was earned in the three months of this year. And, you know, over that, um, that 
period of time, in a short window of time, um, more banking fallout has happened and more things have happened that, that is still evolving. And it will continue to evolve. And a lot of it as a result is a rapid rise of uh, interest rates. So as part of that, it occurred to me that I should take a closer look at our primary investment, which is the Florida Prime Fund. And the Florida Prime Fund has uh, over 20 uh, two billion in it, mostly assets from state municipalities, and to look at two things: one, their portfolio, and two, their investment policy. The investment policy is the thing that guides any entity to manage safety and achieve their objectives. Um, so, as I went through their um, credit policy and looked at the assets, I was kind of surprised, and you know, the concern from our perspective is that. We have a need for Florida Prime assets to be used for payroll, to be used for projects. And so those things are all um, more of an immediate short-term need. The Florida Prime Fund is a, a fund that is intended to be, you know, typically under 90 days, okay? Um, but when you look at the asset allocation, um, and it's ironic because uh, yesterday, actually, I haven't even been today, uh, no, it was on late Friday. They issued a statement uh, describing how the Florida Prime Fund basically has, um, you know, an unlimited sector to banking and financial services investments. So they're taking all assets and have the ability to put that in there. And they explicitly say that they may hold up to 80% of their portfolio in the banking and financial sector. Um, to me, that's very concerning to have such a large portfolio all in the banking financial service sector. And the second part of the concern is the majority of it is not domestic, it's international. And so um, that raises a regulatory issue. And the concern with one of the large banks with Credit Suisse was specifically that they had bonds that were put to zero. So it's a fixed income investment. It's not the type of investment that the Florida Prime Fund invests in, but regulations controlling uh, assets that we need for immediate use is probably not a good idea to be too far out, you know. So a domestic, a greater de dom domestic um, allocation is would be preferable. And so the question to us is: the Florida Prime yield in March was 4.84. Um, that's what they yielded for the month of March. Uh, as of you know today, you could get a Treasury money market fund um, more in the neighborhood of 4.7. So you need to ask yourself, is the additional risk of having all these assets in a financial banking sector and overseas worth 15 basis points, maybe, you know, at best 40 basis points, is it worth it? And I think, you know, as you look at it, there's given the banking sector is in a, a bit of a crisis right now, and it's still ongoing, it's far safer to go to a risk-free asset, which is a treasury-based fund. And so conferring with others, um, Brianne and with others, um, to see what the options were, I felt it was very important to get out of the Florida Prime Fund sooner rather than later. And so we initiated the transactions, um, and I understand Brianne spoke with each of you, and the concerns around it being that we really do need to preserve our safety, and we don't know what's around the corner on these things. And so on uh, March 21st, we transferred 50 million, which is the maximum you can transfer out. The following day, we did 2.7 million, and then today, the remain we have an additional residual dividend of 140,000 that was initiated to transfer out tomorrow. So we will be totally out of the Florida Prime Fund. And the uh, I think the Prime Fund needs to readdress their al asset allocation, as well as their investment policy. And um, maybe there will be a time when it, it's appropriate to go back into the fund. But given the environment that we're in currently, um, it seemed like a, just a, a more of an urgent need to get out rather than being trapped in the fund completely. So. That's the, the story. Thanks. Um, did you did you give your recommendations to the Florida Prime people that they need to do that? <laughs> Call back saying it was risk managed. 
Uh, yes, Bob. And I, I think, Craig, if I'm not mistaken, you did um, talk to our partners downtown about their uh, investment uh, portfolio. As far as the, the T-bills and in, in, in the, the latter section, you want to give us an explanation as to how the T-bills are set up and what we're doing? Um, well, we were actually going to, we entered a treasury money market fund. So the money market fund is a very large fund and the prospectus should have been sent to everyone. That that fund is all treasury risk-free. So, and, it, and it's a shorter duration. Brianna, if you have, I didn't see the, uh, the email that Craig was talking about you know, on the investments that we had. So if, if there's something you can give to us, Craig. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm satisfied with the decision that we made for obvious reasons. Uh, you know, I, I was surprised at the amount of holdings that the, this fund had overseas in, in the banking, and with banking being the way it is these days, I'm a little nervous about having that much with Florida Prime. Yes, we will check on that. I thought everybody got that email um, just explaining what happened. Check yours. You may have sent it. But I don't. In, okay. First, since, I ha since I'm heavily invested in the treasury money market, thank you for validating my decision. Um, uh, second, also I want to, again, thank you for your stewardship. Uh, you know, uh, you've pro you're probably saving us a, lo a lot of grief by uh, moving the money to a risk-free environment and at re uh, relatively a very, very low cost. I mean, 15 basis points in the realm of things is not all that much considering the size of our por portfolio. Um, I'm all for uh, uh, the uh, moving into treasuries because if treasuries are no good, we're in real trouble. So um, uh, I think you're making the right move. And um, I'm, for myself, I'm very happy with it. I am alarmed though at the extent of foreign investment on the part of, Pri of Florida Prime. Um, because if I'm not mistaken, there are a lot of municipalities that uh, have a big chunk of their money invested with that organization. So I hope uh, other people sit up and take notice the way you have. Point is that it was not easy to identify the fund with uh, Northern Trust. They offered us, um, and initially, they offered us a retail fund, and ultimately, they gave us the institutional fund and all treasury fund. But one of the funds they also offered was a government fund, and they transfer. You know, we transferred the initial fifty-two million into the um, treasury money market fund. But I noticed on the account statement, which we've just received, a small portion was in a government fund. It's still similar in security in nature, but I need we need to go back and just fine tune that aspect of it to find out why they they put it in that fund i'm not exactly sure why they did that so it might have been interest earnings and that's where they wanted to put it um but we'll go from there discussion we need a roll call commissioner ingle yes. commissioner rollins commissioner vogelsang yes. commissioner wright yes motion passes Okay, and then the final regular business is the district financial forecast. Commissioners, um, several meetings ago, this board asked staff to look into the feasibility of paying off the bond on the west side of the Boca Tica property early. Um, the earliest that the bond can be paid off without penalty would be 2027. That would save taxpayers about $600 to $2,000 in interest. Um, obviously a positive thing. So I worked with Mr. Timberlake on some very conservative approaches to how this could happen, uh, setting up a, a sinking fund and, and working through the next several years to pay off that bond. And it, it is absolutely a possibility. Um, it would limit um, the number of additional projects we could take on besides our current obligations to our facilities that we have now and the projects we already have on the books, like the development of the east side of Boca Tiga. So it definitely restricts us as far as what we can do. There's a lot of things that we don't know. And, and as you guys know, this board only approves a budget year to year. So we can't, we're not going to sit tonight and discuss a budget or discuss CIP projects that will be um, included in next year's budget or not. That's something that you'll do as we go through the budgeting process. But if um, I, I think tonight, I guess we're looking at um, direction wise, if the board, because the board has seen some of this and some of the different 
um, options and ways that it could happen and what it would leave us with and how it would restrict some of us. There's things we don't know, like the, the property values and how they'll fluctuate over the next several years. We don't know. We're, we're obligated to the city under a number of interlocal agreements that don't give us a whole lot of authority over the cost of projects. And so if the city comes along, like right now, it doesn't look like it, but if the city comes along next year and says, here's a $5 million project, and by the way, you guys are obligated to fund this based on this ILA, we'd be obligated to fund that project. So there's some things we can't control, some unforeseen things that we can't, um, uh, that we'd have to consider as we go through the budget cycle every year. Um, so can it be done? Yes. And I think tonight we're just looking for direction that if the board would like to pursue that and, and focus on trying to pay off that bond, we could certainly make that part of our, our budget um, forecast as we as we work into next year's budget, as we start to go forward the, this summer. And I also want to thank Merv because I throw at least 30 different scenarios at him. What happens if the CRA ends? What happens if it doesn't end? What happens if this happens? So he's always, uh, Here's what, you, here's what you got here, here's what you got there. So I thank him very much for working through that and and putting us in it, certainly could do it and certainly could take care of the facilities that we have and the obligations we have as they stand. But there's just so much unknown that it's, I, I would love to say, yes, we can absolutely do this. But I, as you guys know, we can't commit to a budget except year to year. So that's where we stand on it. Uh, it, this is truly a two-edged sword. On one hand, it frees us in the space of the next four years. After that, it frees us from our obligation with the city, and it gives us total control over the west side of the Boca Tica property. On the other hand, as you mentioned, the city could come back to us and say, well, hey, we could, you're on the hook for $5 million, and we're going to do this project this year. We don't care how you come up with the money. You're obligated. Um, which leads me to uh, my next question, which is, if we can't pay it off in 2027, but we can pay it off in 2028 or 2029, we can still do that prepayment, because we, we have what, I think it's 2032? If it takes us an extra year, that's fine. What we would do is, if the board wants to, we would create a budget for you guys to look at when you go through the budget um, approval process this year, a budget that creates a sinking fund. And we would look to allocate, just like we do for beach renourishment, we allocate funds every year to that. And I, I just, I don't want to say tonight that absolutely we'll do this over the course of the next four years and get it done because things could change. And I don't want somebody to come in and beat me up in three years because we are obligated to pay something else and we can't set aside the money that we need to set aside that year for it. But we could certainly set up a sinking fund and work to pay that bond off early. Do we need a motion for this or this is just in instructional? I just need a general direction if everybody wants to see that in the next, if everybody's on board with with looking at doing that and setting that up for the next budget, um, that's what we would do for that budget. Uh, because we do year to year, I would definitely be in favor of it because if circumstances uh, dictate that we can't put money into the sinking fund, uh, then we don't allocate it for that year's budget. So, yes, I would definitely be in favor of uh, setting up a sinking fund in the next budget. I'm trying to remember what the initial uh, idea was behind paying off the bond early. It was it to give us the flexibility of doing uh, with the property what we wanted to do. I, I don't know that uh, our plans for the property would be any different than what we had previously discussed and talked about with Miller Leg, uh, and I think that we, if, if we do a concession agreement or whatever we're doing with uh, the east side of the property, we're still able to do the same type of uh, arrangement uh, on the west side, and I, I don't know that there, when we had the conversation uh, with the city council, uh, what was their uh, feeling about the the golf uh, on the west side. Were the they... city the city gave their thumbs up on the conceptual master plan. The problem we have is with the bond in place that it restricts the type of agreements that we can um, have over there. Whereas we don't have the bond on the east side, so we can do a general concessionaires agreement and not worry about causing a um, a problem with the bond. Well, we're still able to do a concessionaire agreement on the west on the west side. 
not with the bond in place, it would be different. The, the bond is okay. is restricting so that some was, of the opportunities. That the That's the big holdup. Yeah. Was because of the conflict with the bond. Okay. Well, I I I think if you're putting it in a sinking fund, uh, it's while it might be earmarked for that, it's certainly we had the flexibility if we get into a jam to draw on that to to push the date that we pay the bond off a little bit further out. So uh, I I think I would be uh, in, in in favor when we get into the budget process and it's it's an annual thing and we, we can't budget more than one year out, but we can certainly be cognizant of where we want to go and by 2027, I think. So I think I would uh, I'd be in agreement to uh, set up a seeking fund. Clarification for the public that um, we aren't doubling up on our payments, say, uh, we're not putting in uh, paying off 3.6 million next year and 3.6 million the year after that. We're putting it in the sinking fund and then when the time comes, we will be able to pay off the bond. I just wanted the public to be aware of that. So further clarification. So how much is it that and when does it turn off? You could you could pay it off in 2027 early. We have till 2032 on it. So the current so debt is due in 2032. Correct. As scheduled. And how much is the total right now? It's like right, six, now we're about 15, 16 million left. 16 today. million? Yeah. Yeah. So look, I, I think Steve, the idea that it it being a sensitivity in the analysis isn't a good idea. We can look at it in the budget process, but you know, a general rule of thumb is why would you want to get rid of the the credit capacity that you have with the city at a very low interest rate, particularly in today's environment, um, you can, you're going to borrow at a much higher rate, but you're doing it for the purposes of starting the project sooner, assuming the city would not approve it or allow us to move forward with it. I think, you know, it's kind of nice having the city as guardrails to say what they'd like in it. It's a big property. They help finance it. I'm hopeful that the city steps up and says, hey, they want to do some of these things. And I, I think ha not doing anything with it is a good thing because ultimately someone's going to have to come up and do something. It's not going to remain empty forever, but at some point it will be. And that's an obligation we owe to the city. So the city has a need to, they also have an incentive to do something with it as well. So we can look, I say, look at the analysis as we go through it. It doesn't mean we have to do a sinking fund or do anything right now. Uh, first. Uh, this isn't a revolving for, uh, credit facility. So this is a, a fixed bond that we're obligated to pay off. So uh, in my mind, uh, we have a debt that we're responsible for. We're paying interest on that debt. If we can save ourselves three or four or five years worth of interest, it's to our benefit. And this is the way I'm looking at it. And, and again, if we we have the flexibility of saying yay or nay at any point as far as putting money in. Um, so uh, uh, I'm also like uh, Bob, when it comes to the city, I'm a little bit cynical. Um, they're not trans, they haven't been, I don't want to talk about what they might do go going forward, but they haven't been transparent as to their intentions with the property. We went, uh, through uh, a lot of aggravation, I think on their side and on our side, uh, when the I, the I, idea of uh, financing the golf course uh, came up for discussion, um, I, I want to avoid that. Uh, and uh, I do want the city's input into what happens with the property, ha what's built on it, and you know, and what's done with it. But uh, I don't want the city to have absolute control over that by way of the of holding the bond and what's in the agreement uh, in the bond agreement. So that's uh, my look at uh, what the advantages are to this. And again, if it's something that's really not doable, then it's not doable. But if it is, uh, I, this is something I would like to do. 
that's fine. I'm saying let's do it as a sensitivity. However, you know, me being the finance guy mm -hmm. says, how much is the bond we're paying at right now, Brian? 2.6, is it? So we pay a, an interest rate of 2.6 plus a sinking fund of it, okay? Today's rate I just told you was over, is right now like 470, mm -hmm. okay? So we're making money on this, you know, having that debt. We can take, by not having, having that money invested, we have 50 million in the account right today. We could send the money over to the city and end our, our security, but we are actually making money on the loan that was taken out years ago. So um, what, what my thinking if is- you pay it early, you're not gonna have that opportunity. You're not gonna get the, the interest earnings that you have currently. You're, you're getting rid of your credit capacity. Well, um, as a rule, we don't borrow money as the Beecham Park District. So um, uh, that's not a uh, further uh, indebtedness is not uh, something that I think we have to worry about. Uh, my concern is what happens with, with that property and uh, what our flexibility is in dealing with the property and building what our con our constituents want uh ag again with input from the city but um whereas uh, while we have while we're putting away that money we're uh, in a sinking fund we're still gaining interest on it am i correct all right it's roughly two and a half percent if that's the market above that that's four hundred thousand a year to us on 16 million okay yes. so so if we put, I don't know, let, for argument's sake, a uh, million dollars into the fund at 4.7%, uh, if it's compounded annually, we're, we're getting an annual rate conceivably of 4.7%. That means we're making something in the neighborhood of 50 grand a year on that million dollars, 45,000. I will say that, you know, you're getting, um, by having the money and having it in our account, you're not paying off a 2.6% debt. And that's a good thing. You want to have low, low rate debt. And I, and I get it. There's a different reason you want to do it. If your goal is to stop spending on all other capital projects and pay off the debt in a three, four, five year time, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you can do that, but you will not have the capital to do other projects and it will well, cost you. That's why I'm saying we're doing it on a year to year basis. If we need the money for other capital projects, then we use the money for the other capital projects that uh, we're required to do or, you know, that there's a need to do. But also um, we're paying out interest at 2.5%. 2, 2. It's a two edged sword. Do, you know, we're still paying that money out regardless of what we do with the sinking fund. We're still making a payment of 1.6 million a year, regardless. I agree with you, but here's where I'm going with it. I don't wanna be constrained with the goal um, to pay off the debt for the purposes of doing something, because I think it ties yourself up more than it's needed. When you really want, you really wanna do is focus on the projects that we have and the development of the east side, as we've outlined, and I think we've outlined also that every project we started here has never come in exactly at budget. In fact, it's come mostly over budget. So focus on the projects at hand. If you get the opportunity to pay it off early, you know, great. I, I anticipate, I don't know what Merv has in the budget for interest this year, but if we stay on our current path, it's gonna be over 2 million. It wasn't what we thought about in September. Uh, we didn't know that. And, you know, if you stay on it for a couple of years, you're gonna have a lot more money on it. So. I would just say, look, we've done really good so far. Let's take some of that extra earnings that you described. We can put it aside, but let's not constrain ourselves and, and, and try to work with the city to get a plan together to do this thing quicker. Like Bob said, uh, if we need to draw on that money for other needs, then we draw on the money for other needs. Uh, I'm not saying put it in a silo and say, this is, to use an old uh, expression about Social Security, this is a lockbox and it can't be touched. I'd like to put, be able, uh, all things being equal, to put it away and not have it touched, but if we need it, we need it. Um, but uh, I would just like to be able 
if we can, to do it. And if we can, to pay off that debt early so that we don't have to worry about what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of agreement we can have on the west side with, uh, with uh, P3 developers. We're not as, con uh, as constrained as we would be. We're looking at the east side, and we can literally do what we want to do. We have a competition going on down here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, certainly I had anticipated that our treasurer, who's the numbers guy, would have that option and, and certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, you know, but having looking down the horizon where um, – where we could pay the bond off early may or may not make sense, but certainly uh, having some ideas to where we want to go. If if you don't know where you're going to go, any road will take you there. So, and I think we at least have an idea uh, of, of, of setting the funds aside. Now, <clears throat> the question, uh, uh, Brian, uh, did not we have any development options on the west side? And and so that's solely the reason why we wanted to pay off the bond, so we could do that. Correct. So uh, none of the uh, none of the uh, options that we had looked at uh, leasing, uh, concessionaire agreement, any of that was uh, appropriate with the the bond. So so the idea was that sooner we got to pass the bond issue, we could start developing it. But you know, once we do that, you know, it's going to be another five or six years because we won't have the money to do it because we paid off the bond. So uh, I, I think there's um, there's some validity what uh, Craig said, but at the same token, I, I wouldn't mind, you know, uh, you know, adding to our reserves and, and a sinking fund. We, we, we can always, when we get to the, the budget uh, year after next, decide we're not going to put anything in the sinking fund because we have these other projects. I, I mean, it could be that, uh, You've all been around here long enough where we talked about to redoing Gumbo Limbo, you know, the facility over there, and that was about a $24 million project. So uh, not that that's something that's on the horizon, uh, but certainly if something like that came along, we may be uh, obligated or, or, or want to do that project rather than trying to pay off this bond. So uh, for purpose of discussion, and that's all we're doing is trying to give you some direction. I mean, when it comes to the the budget process, I mean, I don't I don't know that we need to make a decision uh, tonight, or that you've heard the conversation. Let's just uh, uh, know where we are. We, we've seen how we can do it. The question was asked: Can we pay the bond off early? We've mm -hmm. proven that we can do it at at some expense to other projects. Uh, so I don't know that we need to uh, uh, debate this much further. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. it was just a, for when the budgeting process does come along for it to be an option for us to discuss when we do get there. And just for us to know that it is an option that we can do. So, I mean, I'm in favor of it as an option. And then when we get to the budgeting process, we really look at it and see if it's something we wanna set aside. I get the the money-making thing, but I hate being in debt. I really do. <laughs> the worst, the worst feeling in the world. So, um, especially to the city, and I'm optimistic that there is a new council members that are on board, um, but I just, I'm usually half, you know, glasses half full. When it comes to city, my line of my glass keeps going down for some reason. Um, I mean, we can't even get a joint meeting with them at this point. Um, so to work with them on the West side on anything at this point, not even talking about the bond and getting past that, um, just getting them on board with, I mean, they did give us a thumbs up on the master plan, but they didn't really talk about specifics or anything like that. So when it came down to it, whether they would actually support golf on the, on the West side is a whole nother story. So, um, I mean, I'm really supportive of, of us paying that off if we can, and if it doesn't, um, affect our other projects negatively. So I think it's a, a good, good place that we're at at the moment. And then when the budgeting process comes along, we'll take a look at it and see if it's a good option for us. So, yeah. Anything else on this? Nope. Okay. Um, approval of payroll and invoices. Chair, I'd like to make a motion for approval of payroll and invoices in the amount of $1,208,351.19. I'll second that. 
Commissioner Ernst. Commissioner Engel. Commissioner Rollins. Commissioner Vogelsang. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Motion passes. Okay, reports and discussion items. Director Harms. Commissioners, just an update on the playground at Patch Reef. We have a kickoff meeting next week with WZA, and we've invited Mr. David Ogman to come sit in on that meeting, as well as um, a couple other people that Commissioner Vogelsang gave me to sit in on that and provide some input from the public and, and those who have family members who may utilize this playground. Um, at our last meeting, the board asked for an update on the operations of the pickleball facility at Patch Reef. So the city did get us their uh, plan late last week. Um, Melissa and I are going to meet with uh, city staff this week to talk about it, go through it. So we'll put that on the agenda um, at the next meeting to talk about the operations of the Patch Reef Park Pickleball Center. I know that was something that uh, Commissioner Ernst wanted to put on an agenda for this week. We didn't get it there, but we do have their stuff now. So we'll add that to next agenda. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Commissioner Wright and I attended the um, changeover for city council. So um, congratulations to Mark Whitger and, and Fran Knockless on their um, swearing in ceremonies and their appointments at city council and also to the CRA board. We have a new chair of the CRA um, and, a, and a vice chair of the CRA with Mark and Fran respectively. So um, changes all around. So we'll, hopefully we get some good communication on that side of things. Um, and then I also, um, one of our commissioners is ready to get rid of these partitions. And I just wanted to see if everybody else is ready to get rid of these partitions and we'll take them down. I see a thumbs up, I see a head nod. I know where you stand. I see all the head nods. Okay, we'll get rid of these and pretend like um, it never happened. <laughs> and that's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> just a, a quick item of note. Um, there is a bill in the legislature now. It's Senate Bill 774. It's committee substitute for Senate Bill 774, which has changed during the session. Right now, when you qualify for office and you have an annual obligation like I do, you, you file Form 1s, correct? Religiously, timely, without equivocation. This bill actually would change the requirement for local officials, specifically city officials, and at one point during the course of the session, even city managers, to file Form 6s. To the extent that a Form 6 is something far more invasive than a Form 1, uh, Form 6s are what is filed by county commissioners, by state reps, by state senators, by the governor, by cabinet members, et cetera. It is a net worth statement and is what's called full financial disclosure. It is highly more invasive than a form one. I've been filing a form one for the better part of my life. And the end result of which it teaches that more of a source of where income comes from as opposed to what the dollar values are. Um, the bill has morphed a bit again this week. I have a copy of it, which I've been reviewing. In the bill, there are two, two components of it. They deleted the, the requirements for city managers they now specifically make reference to mayors by name and elected members of the governing body of the municipality, but they also make reference to uh, section 112.3144 of the statutes regarding who are subject to filing annual disclosure. I need to verify more in more detail whether the intention was to go beyond just municipal officials and include all local officials, because replete throughout this bill are references to chapter 112 and specifically to sections with regard to um, filing obligation. So I will I will look into that between now and the session ending. We're now about at the halfway point during the session. There's something else in the bill that, that warrants some consideration, which is the training obligation. You may remember last year we talked about this issue that there was a potential for obligating, uh, for example, CRAs and others, other special districts to have a an, epic, an annual ethics training obligation. Um, right now, you're not obliged to do that under the count the, the Palm Beach County Ethics Code, but, but state law could change that discussion. Right now, it appears that they've morphed this bill to just this past week in a session to include CRAs, to require them to have, in fact, ethics training on an annual basis. We, as your lawyers, provide ethics training. I'm sure you've seen this book before. The, uh, this is the Government and Sunshine Manual. This is volume 44. Um, I, I was kind of around since this has been published as an annual publication. This used to be a pamphlet. Literally in the state of Florida, it was a pamphlet and, and the type was very big. Now it's a book and the type is very, very small. Um, within this document relates to chapter 286, which is the Sunshine Law, and chapter 119, the Public Records Law, both of which are founded in the Florida Constitution, Article 1, Section 24. Not Article 20, not Article 15, Article 1. So the Florida Sunshine Amendment, which is the basis for the Sunshine Law, 
is actually in the Florida Constitution. So a lot of things are happening in Tallahassee. Um, this bill may be applicable to special districts. There are references to it, but we'll know more about that as things progress. The lobbyists uh, who, I guess, lobby for city managers where they get their names removed from the, from the bill, uh, that does not mean that special districts are exempt yet. Um, it looks like they are, but I'm not sure. And you'll know, you won't know till you know, like that road you just spoke about, not knowing where the road's going until you get there. So the session we know has 60 days. What happens in 60 days can be very determinative of what happens to local officials. Um, we're also tracking some of the bills that relate to special districts as well uh, regarding maintenance issues, not specifically any of which have any direct reference to this district, but we'll keep up that conversation with our executive director as things progress. I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll work on the documents that you asked us to look into um, to the extent I can answer any questions. And I'm not suffering from laryngitis. I'm really happy to try. <laughs> so. Well, form one looks like an easy form. It's not as easy as it looks. Not even close. So That's good. My, my question to you would be, Sam, as you go through this, if we are required to do form six, does that mean Merv will be doing these things at an additional cost? Or can we no, get a third done, party do this? No, they're actually done by you individually as individual filers. It's called full financial disclosure under the Constitution. And, 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 and the form is filed in Tallahassee uh, with the Ethics Commission, uh, locally with the supervisor. But it's, it is a document that speaks in terms of um, all of your assets. So, for example, if you own a home with your wife, um, even though she's not an elected official under the Form 6, that house has to be disclosed. Um, mutual debts, uh, other obligations, but it is a far more invasive document and requires, it, it, essentially, it, it's, your, it's your tax return. Sure. I guess my, my the, the question I'm trying to get to is, is the both forms, but the Form 6 is even more complicated. And, it is. you know, the point being is, you know, well, what's the appraised value of the house? If the house is valued at, um, you know, how we value it. Do we use Zillow? Do we use, you know, realtor.com? You know, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to value things. Right. And my concern would be, I'd hope that we have a little bit more support. I consider myself a financial educated person who can fill out form right. one, but when I read form one, it's not as easy as you think. No it you kind of goes down different little rabbit holes of a path and things. And I'm not sure if I'm answering it correct, but I think I am. Um, right. Form six, that's the last thing I really want to deal with. I would hope that we could have, you know, someone with some knowledge and expertise help us. If I may, and your point's very well taken. I don't, I don't mean this to be a, a pejorative comment towards the, the folks in Tallahassee, but you didn't sign on to file a Form six when you ran for office here, nor did any, any city officials down the road in the city of Oakland Town either. Um, it is something which has been traditionally a state obligation for both state senators, state representatives, and for county commissioners and state officers but not local officers. That's not what you all you know, signed on for. Um, it is, it is um, an obligation which if, if the Form 1 is complicated and there are, there are many pathways in a Form 1 that can be misunderstood um, and clearly misunderstood, and you won't know until you know that you have a violation when someone files a complaint against you or someone looks at your Form 1 randomly, which is not typically done, and finds some inconsistency not unintended by you in the filing. Um, the Form 6s are far more complicated the penalties are, are, are I don't say severe, but they're not pleasant. There are fines and other other types of penalties could, could occur. Um, but in many instances, I'm going to give you a quick example, and I'll close with this. Um, the, the the chair of the South Florida Regional Planning Council is a former U a former state senator, Steve Geller, who's a fairly well known guy here in South Florida. Um, he was in the state the state senate for many years. He's now a county commissioner in Broward. Um, so during a recent presentation to some local officials in Broward, I pulled up for this public record his form six. It's a great example. If you ever, if you want to ever look to see how they're done, um, with a local official who is a lawyer, who is a former state senator, um, you can go on to the to the Florida Ethics Commission website. You pull up the individual's name, and you can get the filing, and they're they're right there in your face. Um, and I, and to Steve's uh, to Senator Geller's uh, credit, it is really very nicely detailed, um, and it it tells an interesting story, uh, how as Commissioner Ernst happily put it, it is a detailed document. You know, from but how you value things will matter. Like how you actually detail that valuation will matter more. But I, I just use them. I don't have it with me this evening, but it's a very easily accessible public record. You go to the Ethics Commission website, um, and they have the jurisdiction by the Constitution. I pulled up Steve's name under that reference. It's sure. a it's a very I think it, I haven't told him that, but I, it's public record out there. It's a very well drafted document, and I think represents the kind of complications that we could avoid 
I think Merv could be exceptionally helpful um, if you would offer up his help as needed during the course of time if the bill morphs into requiring districts like yourselves to do this. Days, whether we have to do it or not. We'll let you know as soon as I know, absolutely. But, but, with, but with regard to, to the, the current governor's status, um, he has a way with the, with the folks in Tallahassee in a very positive way for himself. And I say that not in a partisan way, just as a factual way. The open carry bill passed and was signed by the governor's office, which is another issue which I would not want to talk about this evening. But open carry does have an issue with this, with our organization, with this organization. Um, you cannot bring a, a weapon into this chamber. But, that, but there are some interesting aspects of that bill, which, which I've yet to read in detail, that relate to how things are used in a park, for example, and other public pu public facilities. Sam, was that open carry or just a constitutional you, carry? Where you can carry, <clears throat> carry a concealed weapon without a permit. That is correct. Okay. They, they call it constitutional carry, right. essentially. But we are getting inquiry now from all of our local governments as of today, which means what, what, is, what, changed, what, what changes does that mean in the law for our public, public buildings? We know you can't take a weapon into a public, into a commission chamber. There's a reason for that. But what about the other parts of the building? The other parts of when you walk into a public building and and you're asked if you're carrying a weapon, well, you can't ask anymore, and you couldn't ask before either. So, so our parks are a place that if you can just bring in a weapon. And yes. So is there? So there's no. We can't. We can't do anything in terms of right. our parks, in it, terms of making it. That was the it. bill that we discussed. That was the statute we discussed last year where the Supreme Court this past year um, was, was, was reviewing Chapter 790 with regard to the fact that the legislature has preempted the control of guns and ammunition solely to itself, only to the legislature. We did a memo on that last year. You may remember because you asked about it, and it was scary to write it. It was also scary to read about it because the Supreme Court this past year ruled on the gun management bill and ruled against the local government. So am I concerned about this? I am. And I had a brief discussion with our director this evening, and she's equally uh, concerned about this issue, having had the governor sign the bill just today. So this, is, this, this will evolve into something of a larger discussion later, but it, but it, it is of great concern, Madam Chair. I must confess. On the other hand, we've had some wonderful tort to reform yes. that's going to help us with our insurance premiums, hopefully, in a couple of years. So, but, uh, Not for a couple of years, it, though. It's, it's, going to t it's going to take a while for the new capital to come in, take advantage of the limited litigation, and for the uh, uh, the large law firm that filed 25,000 uh, uh, lawsuits right before the bill was signed, uh, those have got to flush out first. But uh, I, I think that uh, we've made some significant uh, progress to get ourselves out of this judicial hellhole, as they describe it. So Good. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Inner things. I have about 40, 46, but no. Um, I want to wish everyone here, uh, those that are following us on uh, on Zoom, uh, happy holiday season. We have Passover coming up in a couple of days, and Easter's is coming Sunday. So I uh, hope you all enjoy the holiday, enjoy your families, if you know, and your friends. Uh, and eat a lot it's okay harold you can eat um and um uh also i wanted to know uh as far as a uh, hard opening for ocean strand uh where do we stand with that still waiting for the signs to get finalized we're hearing that the they should be in by the 18th so we just want to check those and then we would do a, a ribbon cutting out there. I mean, it's open now. The public can go in there and yeah. they are enjoying it. But, I, I was there um, and I had a I, great I, time. I just hate to set a date until I know for sure that nothing like um, some sort of, I, I don't even want to say anything out loud for it to actually happen, but <laughs> with the signs, I just want to get them in and then we'll schedule it. And um, yeah, that's about it. Just uh, one note is that um, if we, if everyone hasn't read it, there was a, article in the Coastal Star about the 2,500 property on Ocean Strand. And it basically is about the uh, federal judge who um, went through excruciating detail of how things evolved with that. And right or wrong, um, I think there's a lot of lessons learned 
in it for all of us. And we, at some point, everyone should carefully read it because it, it's, it ties into everything that we're involved with, particularly with uh, Boca Tica, because it's property. There's a lot of interested parties. People want different things. People are doing different things. And it's important to have the open mind um, until something is on the agenda where you're asked to make a decision. And I, I think that's very important. And it's also equally important, um, the sunshine rules to abide by them exactly with what they say. It just reinforces, you know, it's kind of surprising that some people who, you know, would know better are texting one another. And that, that just is beyond, you know, that's just, you don't do that, <laughs> you know, okay. So I get it. I can, if I had to text you as a friend to do something, fine, but you're not going to have a conversation about something that's district related. And I think while I've been on this board, we've all had a, I think a, um, a good um, relationship and we keep the district business in the district. And we have, this reminds us that you always need to do that. So that's all. Nothing to report, uh, Madam Chair. I want to thank Craig for his insight uh, into this banking situation. I have a son who's a, a investment banker in California, and he's tearing his hair out right now. So thank you very much. Um, also, I'd like to congratulate the incoming city council members, uh, Fran Nacklis and Mark Wigner. And I also, this, um, this afternoon, I just happened to turn on the Golf Channel, and they had this drive chip and putt for the young people i don't know if you've ever seen this and i am so excited that at some point we're going to have kids from palm beach county or actually boca del rey deerfield who might be participating in this because they will eventually have a, a facility where they can practice and and um, participate in these type of competitions these are where our professionals are going to come in the uh, in the future, and these kids were just so amazing. And I hope that the, the kids in our community have that same opportunity. And I just like to encourage a joint meeting with the city council if we can get that going. I would be so happy. And happy Passover and happy Easter to everyone. Move to adjourn. Commissioner Engel? Commissioner Rollins? Commissioner Vogelsang? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Motion passes.